come back after the summer break. I hope you all had a nice summer. Um, today we have a, a paper by Margaret Jacobson from Vienna University uh, on aggregate risk and the US housing boom. And you have an hour, Margaret. The floor is yours. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending my webinar. Um, and I'm a fifth year graduate student at Indiana University. Uh, so the question I'm going to ask in this paper is, can lender de beliefs developed from microdata help explain the run-up in prices observed in the United States during the 2000s? For those of you who don't know, during this time period, uh, aggregate house prices increased from their trend, their long-run average of real house prices is about 2%, and they peaked at about 10% in terms of year-over-year -year growth uh, during this time period. From general equilibrium macro models, it's really difficult to generate this increase in house prices because they're typically very strongly correlated with income. So it's just very hard, given the income uh, realizations and the time, to generate this massive run up. Um, why is this topic important or relevant? Um, understanding the drivers of the housing boom and bust, this could essentially help repeat the damaging events of 2008. Again, there was sort of this atypical movement in house prices and understanding what drove this uh, may be key for future events. And um, models incorporating beliefs, they tend to successfully generate the housing boom and those based on fundamentals, they tend to struggle and um, can typically generate counterfactual movements in other dimensions. What I mean by fundamentals here, this is anything from income growth to population growth, to interest rates, to financial conditions. And I'm gonna talk about these uh, and their role in this episode in a little bit more detail. Uh, so these papers by uh, Burnside et al., Kaplan, Mittman, Vitalante, uh, Jelaine, Lansing, and uh, Piz Pizzacci and Schneider, um, they use various forms of uh, beliefs in these macro frameworks, and they can typically show that some departure from rational expectations uh, can help. So my contribution with this paper is, um, to my knowledge, I think I would be the first to sort of use this microdata to help construct these beliefs. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail on um, how I plan to do that. Uh, so this paper is going to rely Excuse on, me? yes. Hello, uh, sorry, may I just ask, so Jess Belinda from the Riggs Bank. So um, you talked about various reasons why we see this very sharp increase in housing prices. And I was just wondering, so what about, say, falling equilibrium real rate? Could that be an explanation? So, you know, if you have a preferences over your uh, expenditure share of housing and, you know, the equilibrium real rate falls, is, could that be like a big driver of um, house prices? Uh, so I think that result has typically been mixed. Of I've seen some papers that show that that is quantitatively important and others say that, again, it's just not large enough to generate uh, the increase. So in, in the framework I'm going to work in, this uh, Favalukas, Levinson, Van Neuerberg paper, they show that sort of, um, I guess they rely more on a global savings glut than the decline in real rate um, to, uh, and, and they show that that's less quantitatively important than other, other dimensions. Um, but I would be happy if you have any suggestions on papers I should look at to um, uh, discuss this episode. And I know some of the work looking at the housing boom globally also seems to have mixed results on whether these uh, declining interest rates are import uh, quantitatively important or not. No, I'm just curious. So. Okay. Um, so uh, going back, so uh, the framework I'm going to use in this paper is a general equilibrium life cycle model with uh, aggregate risk incomplete markets and defaultable debt. And the two papers it uh, is most closely to is, as I mentioned, this one by uh, Favalukas, Van Neuberg, and Levinson. And they find that uh, the relaxation of financial conditions during this time period uh, leads to the quantitative increase in, um, they look at not, not house prices, but the uh, a house price to rent ratio. And then uh, Kaplan, Mittman, Violante, they add in defaultable debt and rental markets and say they can't generate that same result. And they say that instead, uh, a belief shock, which they say is a shift to a state where a preference shock to housing may occur, um, can generate the, the boom and is quantitatively important for the boom. Um, so my goal with this paper is to compare the path of house prices generated from a model uh, with rational lenders to one with uh, forecasting rules based on a VAR of past values of income, house prices, and delinquencies at the US state level. Um, I'm gonna show you in a few slides why I think sort of looking at this, this I might get some uh, helpful identification from this uh, disaggregated data. 
And um, right now, today, I'm going to mostly just show you results from the, the rational model. I'm still working on uh, the beliefs component. Um, so these local elements, uh, they were typically important in uh, past U.S. housing episodes, and uh, most were regional in scope and typically justified by fundamentals. Um, speeches by Alan Greenspan throughout this period in 2002, 2003, he's saying there's no national housing market in the U.S., there's just these local markets. Um, and uh, the sort of long-term goal I would like to do with this, this strand of work is to incorporate these elements into, uh, from these beliefs into some sort of Bayesian updating framework. Um, so this way I don't have to rely on exogenous expectations from the DAR and could um, potentially maintain rational expectations. Um, so kind of going back to one of the, the, the secondary questions of this work is uh, what made beliefs so important about this particular episode rather than other episodes of uh, United States housing cycles or other um, global housing cycles. And um, as many of you know, there was this shift in mortgage finance around the 2000s, broadly speaking. Um, in the macro context, this has been studied as the relaxation of borrowing constraints um, and increased mortgage lending to riskier borrowers. Um, as was mentioned, there was also this uh, general decline in um, mortgage risk premia in the United States. Um, as I mentioned, uh, under rational expectations, uh, these relaxed borrowing constraints, so typically uh, an increase in a loan to value ratio, has had mixed results and remains debated in the literature. Um, and one issue uh, typically with these uh, extension of credit to riskier borrowers is once the uh, business cycle dynamics and defaultable debt is included, um, this is going to essentially work against the goal of this paper and dampen mortgage prices. So agents know that future downturns are going to lead to defaults. And since mortgage debt is long term and illiquid, these future shocks, they're going to be still salient, even if um, house prices are high today. Uh, so this is why in this framework I'm going to show you it's typically hard to, to generate this increase in house prices. Um, some success in this is that a paper by Baza Mendoza, uh, these agents rely on this Bayesian updating framework and they're trying to learn if these changes in the financial conditions uh, have been per are, are permanent or temporary and in this learning process they can get um, a bigger increase in uh, house prices over this period. Um, so as I mentioned, looking at sort of the disaggregated data here, I have uh, uh, house price growth for uh, 20 US uh, MSAs. Um, and so if I zoom in on a few examples of uh, the housing boom, it hit at different times and it hit very unevenly. So Phoenix here was sort of at the epicenter of the sand states and the boom, and it had reached uh, nearly 50% uh, house growth at a certain point in time. And uh, Cleveland, which is a uh, more of a Rust Belt city that has faced structural decline over this time period, they virtually had no increase in house price growth, but they suffered a bust. And if you look kind of in the period previously, um, the growth rate of these two cities uh, look very similar. So I'm gonna try to see um, if from these beliefs, I can incorporate some of this, this variation. And as I mentioned, the model I'm gonna show you today, it's gonna to look mostly like Cleveland, where even though you're gonna get this sort of increase in income over this, this time period, there's no increase in in-house prices. Um, so with the model, um, I'm gonna have two types of agents, uh, borrowers and lenders. And uh, the lender here is gonna be infinitely lived, a representative lender and have risk neutral preferences. Uh, there is a continuum of heterogeneous finitely lived borrowers, and these are HJ, and they're going to have preferences over uh, consumption and housing. Um, for right now, for analytic simplicity, I'm working with uh, separable preferences. Uh, this literature uh, typically uh, uses some sort of uh, aggregate preference, and that can sort of um, help with the uh, quantitative results. Uh, so there's incomplete markets, so the borrowers can't risk share among themselves and they're gonna borrow uh, loans from these lenders. Um, there's no short selling of assets and no idiosyncratic risk for now. Um, this is just to strip down the model to the, the main mechanism, which is the aggregate risk. Um, and these borrowers are gonna face this uh, aggregate stochastic income endowment. Um, these incomplete markets, along with the aggregate risk, this is gonna lead to this distribution over borrower states is gonna become a state variable in this setup with these two elements. 
So uh, the uh, individual states for borrowers are going to be their loan endowment and then also their housing endowment. Um, and this is for, as I mentioned, with the life cycle framework, each borrower is age J. And um, for default here, I'm using a reduced form of default, and it's going to be entirely income driven. Um, and again, this is just to kind of strip down the model to, to pretty basic elements. Um, and some uh, sort of evidence of this is that uh, 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 work on sort of uh, default by Foot and Willen, they find that prior to 2008, a few borrowers with negative equity uh, defaulted, and it was really sort of these income driven episodes. They find that uh, negative equity, so this is where uh, the value of the loan is more than the value of the house. Um, it, a lot, it, it, it was a, the, the number of borrowers who defaulted with this in 2008 rose, but prior to this, it really took some sort of unemployment shock or income shock to force borrowers into default. So this would be the, the framework of the time period. Um, and the way I'm gonna set this up in the reduced form way is that with this probability uh, new that depends on the income realization, uh, borrowers can default at zero cost. And essentially uh, this uh, zero default cost probability is gonna be equal to one when in their income realization is lower than some threshold. Um, and uh, the infinite default cost is the complement of this, and this is gonna occur essentially when income is above this threshold, and this is when borrowers will not default. Um, may, may I ask you like a stupid question? Sure. Uh, if you think about the subprime crisis, was this mm -hmm. really like an income thing, or I thought that was like a uh, payment thing, you know, they had to pay more at some point rather than uh, say income risk, no? Okay, so it was sort of the idea that they were hit with some um, interest rate shock that sort of made these these payments uh, not viable during this time period. Um, I would say in, in, in the latter portion to explain the the bus that would certainly be the case. Um, but I think in the in the boom and I'm going to show you uh, uh, once I get to the the results of uh, labor productivity was essentially rising over this time period. So um, yeah most of these borrowers would have been uh, having a favorable income shock. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but that's not something I could certainly um, in, incorporate in, in future work. Um, oh, was that somebody else? And also on this on the same note, um, so the, the mortgages here, the loans will be adjustable rate or fixed rate? Oh, that's a good point. So the loans here are going to be a fixed rate. And uh, for right now, they're just going to be uh, one period loans. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to sort of get the uh, quantitative movements and match sort of the volume of mortgage lending, I would need to add in other elements of sort of resale or uh, uh, home equity lines of credit to get enough movement. Um, uh, but certainly in terms of going back to the subprime, most subprime borrowers over this time period would have faced uh, these adjustable rate loans with these teaser rates. Um, and that yeah. might have certainly influenced their, uh, their mortgage decisions and kind of going back to my theme of if they're sort of uh, not paying attention to this uh, sort of rate increase in the future, or expecting to be able to refinance, that, that could play a role in the dynamics. Um, because especially when you have a, a mechanism that relies a lot on beliefs and you would think that uh, uh, um, if there is adjustable rate mortgages, uh, sort of the, the mechanism could work through these. Um, and, and there was a substantial amount out in the, in, in the years ahead mm -hmm. of the crisis. I think now they're much fewer. Right. Um, so kind of going back of uh, the literature has typically found that uh, although the share of subprime was growing over this time period, um, these sort of uh, borrowers who would have not had access to credit prior to this episode, um, they're really just a still a, a small fraction compared to the overall um, sort of universe of borrowers who increased uh, mortgage debt over this time period. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, in this framework, uh, the aggregate states of the economy here are going to be the income realization and, as I mentioned, um, the distribution over uh, the realization of, or the, the borrower's um, individual states. Um, so uh, the current period housing, um, and so uh, essentially uh, working here, the consumption of the borrowers, it's gonna be equal to their income realization Y, uh, 
And then also uh, their current period housing, uh, less any housing they purchased in the current period. Um, and this is valued at price P and housing here is uh, subject to a depreciation um, each period. And uh, they're also going to borrow loans, the uh, LB prime, and these are going to cost price QB. Essentially, uh, these borrowers are going to be offered a menu of loan contracts that I'm going to talk about um, how those are priced in, in the next slide. Um, and as I mentioned here, for right now, these, are, these loans are just one period. But to quantitatively match um, the debt to income over this time period, the multi period loans are, are necessary. Um, so with this default, Essentially, if these uh, borrowers do not default, they're going to repay the full amount of their loan um, that they owe the lenders over this time period. And if they do default, essentially, they're going to lose some portion of their housing stock. Um, and here I have uh, the, this alpha parameters is going to characterize that fraction. Um, so if alpha is equal to zero, essentially uh, the loan is more or less sort of uncollateralized of the borrower can just walk away from the loan and they don't surrender any of their housing stock. And this is a very low default burden. Um, and if this is equal to one, they essentially uh, surrender their entire housing. And this is going to have implications um, for uh, the pricing of this model and as well as, as, as the dynamics. Um, and uh, one thing I should mention here in this style of default, essentially the uh, borrowers, they're not um, uh, prohibited from borrowing in a period that they default. Some of these models actually do that. Um, but for here, when, once I move to a, a case with uh, um, a, an endogenous default, uh, that'll, that'll simplify things and having them uh, continuously be able to lend. Um, and uh, typically in this line of literature, uh, loans, they're going to be limited to a fraction of the value of the housing stock. So this theta here represents a loan to value um, parameter. And this is essentially uh, saying that they have to have uh, some uh, um, down payment in the home and equity to put in up front. Um, some of this literature, a uh, paper by Daniel Greenwald has said that uh, these payment to income constraints are more quantitatively important than these loan to value constraints. Um, to include both of those, uh, I need to pay attention to the interaction. So for right now, I'm just sticking to the basic um, loan to value constraint. Uh, Margaret, can, before you move on, can you be a yeah. bit more specific about what happens when uh, a house is lost? So when alpha is equal to a one, I guess? Right. Um, so what's gonna happen here, and um, maybe in the next slide, once I get to the, the equilibrium, um, it'll make a little bit more sense. So uh, there's going to be a fixed loan supply here. So essentially, uh, the house, the uh, borrowers are going to demand the same amount of, of housing stock each period. So when this housing is lost, it's going to ask, it's going to act essentially um, as a um, to bring down consumption in in this framework because they're going to have to sort of uh, pay for that uh, by by lowering consumption today. But will there also be an externality on sort of house prices? Uh... Right. Yes. Yeah. House prices as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so in that dynamic, um, so house prices here are going to kind of be more or less, uh, as I mentioned, very tied to income and consumption. So, if consumption is sort of dropping, then house prices are going to drop more. Um, the higher that that alpha is, um, to that regard. Uh, so, so it's a, it's a, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. But um, if this alpha is very low, then uh, the borrowing is going to also become prohibitive, prohibitively low. Um, so consumption is also going to drop as well, even if uh, they don't surrender a, a large part of their housing. But there's no extra channel coming about uh, through, I don't know, uh, market clearing in the housing market or something. Um, that's something I can look into, but um, not that I know of. Uh, Just the notion of the, uh, the people moving out of their houses and the houses being put on the market, uh, which then sort of um, adds the supply. Uh. Yeah, so, so in this framework, this sort of um, moving in and out of, of housing is, is frictionless. So I think if I added in um, more mm -hmm. frictions in them being penalized more, I think I might get sort of more um, dynamics through, through that channel if, mm -hmm. if that were the case. Um, but I think for, for right now, it's gonna be fairly muted. Mm -hmm. Uh, so moving on to the equilibrium prices here, 
Uh, so uh, the housing demand, so this is the first order condition in, in housing, it's split into two components, and this is a typical asset pricing equation. Uh, so the uh, dividend component here is the marginal rate of substitution between housing and consumption, and this can sort of be thought of the value of having a roof over your head or a shelter. Um, and then the second component here is this uh, expected future price component. Um, and this is essentially the resale value of the house. Um, with the uh, default added here, essentially that's gonna add in this extra alpha term. Um, and so if this uh, alpha is very low, there's the low default burden. Um, this looks like a typical uh, asset pricing equation without default. And then if it's very high, essentially this is gonna work, as I mentioned earlier, this is gonna work against me and really bring down these house prices because uh, these, these borrowers face this, this higher cost. Um, and uh, if uh, this loan to value constraint is binding, that's actually gonna work to help push up house prices. As I mentioned, this has been uh, studied in previous uh, parts of this literature, but it has sort of mixed results and quantitative importance. Um, so the housing supply here is uh, fixed at H bar, and um, this is gonna uh, help deliver this aggregate price for housing rather than uh, a housing for, for each borrower. Um, and uh, the micro foundation for this would be to have these construction firms who hire borrowers um, and produce housing from uh, this household labor. Um, that's going to add in a little bit more uh, elasticity to this supply curve, um, and that's really one of the, the main differences for here. But essentially having this fixed is going to um, make the dynamics a little bit larger in response to these shocks um, than otherwise. Um, and uh, the loan pricing function, this is going to come from the uh, lenders problem. And essentially, these lenders are going to have uh, zero profit and expectation. And uh, the loan market is going to clear loan by loan. So essentially, uh, this uh, loan price is a function of the choice variables of the borrowers and the aggregate states. Um, with this aggregate risk, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, these lenders, they're going to sort of uh, suffer profits and losses over this time period. Um, so if I were to develop this further, they would sort of need to be backed by um, some sort of other owner who's willing to sort of uh, bail them out. This literature typically assumes that uh, it's some sort of foreign lender with, with deep pockets who, who owns them. Um, so to walk through this, uh, what this looks like, um, so my intent right now, the most easiest way to, to introduce beliefs would be to uh, step back from the rational expectations with these uh, lenders here. I'm not going to do this today, but essentially I've denoted that with the, um, the hat over the expectation operators and say that they have to make some forecast of these default probabilities or future prices, um, and that may not um, necessarily be the, be the rational one. Uh, so what happens with this default, this sort of uh, complicated term on the right, um, if these borrowers are going to default, uh, then um, they're going to essentially uh, hand over either the minimum of uh, the, the loan or the value of the house uh, scaled by this alpha. Um, so, this is, so this term is either going to be zero or negative, and this is essentially saying that in this default, or if these lenders expect default, this is going to... Uh, um, bring down uh, this, this price and essentially make the risk premium larger. So these lenders are going to um, essentially try to um, price this, this default risk into this function. Um, so if I get rid of this uh, default entirely, this uh, model is going to more or less uh, nest this model by Giustiniano, Primaceri, and Tambellati, um, illustrating this the same uh, borrower's problem. And essentially, without this default or just in the good state, uh, the loan is uh, loan prices are going to be equal to uh, the risk-free rate here. And may I ask you here the key belief that is about that housing prices will be high in the future plus income will be higher. What you you sort of said it's like two things. It's about house right. prices and income. Is that correct? So you have two. Um, these two dimensions of the positive beliefs, no? Or yes, yes, and then also um, to include sort of the uh, default probabilities, uh, or sort of what, what they think defaults are gonna look like, because again, over this time period, these guys know that they're scaling up, 
um, borrowing to sort of these riskier uh, borrowers. So um, how are they forecasting these these higher um, or these this, these sort of uh, defaults with this this new new group? Um, and yeah, it's, but it's the very, it's, part, but, but the fault are endogenous functional income, no? Uh, here, here they're, they're an, uh, yes, they're, they're an exogenous function of income, so they're going to essentially... So that's um, what I was thinking. It's, it's house prices and house prices and income, really, that you, you know, they right. have their beliefs. Right. Um, so kind of going back to some of the, the results over this time period, um, so I can uh, find the chart, but essentially um, a lot of the uh, regions that sort of had very high house price growth also had very high income growth. So that's something that might be able to be incorporated um, into mm -hmm. this framework and sort of um, lead to these, these lenders. Um, Got you. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Yes. So because why do you think um, placing the behavioral assumption on the lender side, which we typically think are banks, firms, which are more rational than households, why do you want to go down that route? Why don't you insert the behavioral assumption on the household side? Um, that's a very good point for right now. I was going to start with the lenders just because uh, their uh, sort of problem right here with the risk neutrality is the most simple um, in terms of placing it on uh, the lenders with the, or the, the borrowers with the computational method I'm going to use that could potentially um, get more complicated and, and less tractable, um, but that's a very good point about um, thinking about the firms or the banks typically being um, more rational um, during this time period. Um, okay. Uh, so just to pull it all together, uh, so the, with the recursive competitive equilibrium, um, I'm not going to go through the, this whole slide in, in entirely, but essentially uh, I have uh, the main prices here, or as I mentioned, this uh, loan by loan market clearing for um, uh, price Q, and then also the aggregate house price P. Um, and then uh, sort of one of the keys of this aggregate risk component is that uh, there's going to be this perceived law of motion for the state, state space, and essentially it's a, a function that gamma mu that's going to update the distribution. Um, and then uh, the markets, so here I essentially have the two markets, the lending market and then also the housing market um, that are going to clear. And then um, this consistency is satisfied and these perceived laws, laws of motion are going to equal um, the actual. And within the uh, computational method, I'm going to show you sort of a few um, ways that, um, that that can be a little bit tricky with this aggregate risk. Um, so for right now, I'm just using uh, sort of a basic parameterization um, somewhat from the literature. Um, and this is just to illustrate the, the mechanism of the model. Uh, so the uh, period in this model is one year. And so I'm going to have a standard discount factor, a borrower risk aversion of two. Um, loan to value is set uh, the um, conforming of it's a 20% down payment. Um, and as of right now, Agents are going to essentially receive the same uh, income shock until they die. Um, in other versions, I can incorporate retirement or, or more life cycle components. Um, and then the main shock here is this, this aggregate income shock is essentially going to have two states. Um, one is this good state, which is going to be the, the boom period. And then another is the, the bad state. And this process is essentially um, scaled slightly for this model from uh, the work of Kaplan, Mittman, Violante and they calibrate this process to US uh, labor productivity over this time period. Um, so essentially in the, in the boom, which is gonna be the good period, uh, labor productivity is gonna be about six and a half percent higher than the bad. Um, and the default threshold here, uh, the Y bar is essentially set. So these borrowers are going to uh, default in the bad state. So this uh, makes it a little bit uh, sort of uh, the, the exercise I'm going to go through because it's essentially in some of these simulations having them start from, from a default position um, rather than just an income position without default. Um, and right now I'm going to illustrate uh, what this looks like with essentially the full collateralization. So the default loss is going to be one and borrowers have to give up their entire house. Um, housing supply here, as I mentioned, is fixed. So just um, normalized to one. And then the transition matrix uh, for these uh, income states is going to be fairly persistent over this time period. Um, 
So this uh, solution method is going to uh, rely on uh, the Crusell and Smith, and it's also borrowed from, as I mentioned, these other papers with aggregate risk, this uh, Favalucas et al. and the Kaplan et al. Um, and this distribution over borrower states here is going to be an infinite dimensional object. Um, so this computation of these laws of motion is essentially going to be infeasible to, to update uh, the state space. Um, so what this literature does, applying it to the housing boom, is they approximate, um, they, they go after what's called an approximate equilibrium, and they proxy this state space with a lower dimensional vector. So here I'm going to say that it's going to be the log of prices. Um, this is what Kaplan um, et al. use, Favalukas, Levinson, Van Neuerberg, they use a wider um, uh, set of prices and quantities in, in this vector. Um, and so essentially I'm gonna posit a linear forecasting rule for prices to approximate this log motion of the distribution. Um, so as I mentioned in the equilibrium slide, um, I need to know what this uh, updating rule is. And so I'm gonna essentially say here that it's gonna be some, some log linear approximation of, of prices. Um, so if you're familiar with the actual Crusell Smith framework there, they use uh, the aggregate capital stock in their log linear forecasting rule. And in this literature, they typically rely on the house prices because um, sort of you're borrowing and housing variables or any aggregate variables, they're not necessarily gonna be predetermined and they need to, um, uh, th those markets need to clear within this period. So that's a little bit um, less stable in, in, in this framework. Um, so this uh, matrix of coefficients um, is essentially what I'm gonna iterate on in this computational method. Um, and I'm going to essentially have a, a coefficient for each income pair. Um, if anyone would like me to go into more details of the computational method, I would be happy to. Or um, if you uh, believe me that this works, I'm going to go into a few more uh, diagnostics of, of this method as I go through the results. Um, no questions? All right. Uh, so uh, the results today, um, I'm gonna just uh, simulate this income process and this is gonna follow the housing boom and bust um, coming from uh, the Kaplan et al. And in the future, I'm gonna incorporate uh, also this relaxation of, of the loan to value constraints. Um, so essentially, uh, they say that uh, this, this labor income process, it's sort of in this low state in 1996 and starting in 1997 up to 2000, it's gonna be in this higher state. Um, and that's again, right before the, the bust hits. Um, typically the housing boom is sort of dated as starting somewhere around 2000 or even as late as 2003. So they sort of add in these other elements um, later on to, to generate those, those other dynamics. Um, as I mentioned today, I'm just looking at rational expectations and I'm essentially gonna compare the default and no default cases, and also compare this to a uh, representative agent two period model to um, get a little, a little bit more at what, what's going on. Um, so when there's no default, essentially all the prices are gonna be equal to this uh, risk-free rate. And to give a little bit of diagnostics here, so the R squared is gonna be, um, really low in this framework with just including um, these uh, uh, this log linear uh, forecasting rule with prices. Um, and typically in these life cycle models, that can be a little bit of a misleading diagnostic. It's not going to be as high as in an infinite horizon model. Um, so another diagnostic I'm sort of uh, paying attention to is these average Euler equation errors, um, which here they're typically not great. So it's around negative one. Um, for the Euler equation and loan prices and um, close to zero for, for house prices. Um, and another strategy sort of um, of this literature is to add in sort of higher, mo higher moments into this forecasting equation to see if that can sort of um, maybe better approximate this, this distribution over agents that I'm trying to, to get at. Um, so now what happens to the other quantities in the model with this income shock? Um, so consumption, uh, it doesn't really, it sort of closely follows this income. And essentially this is because these lenders don't really have uh, direct exposure to, to this risk. So borrowing over this period is, is really gonna be constant and um, 
sorry, I should have uh, uh, rephrased this earlier. So I've normalized all these charts to uh, to one starting in the uh, the lower state here, and I'm looking at sort of the percentage increase in the lower state. So um, consumption responds a little bit more um, than income, which suggests that there's uh, not really um, a ton of uh, consumption smoothing going on here. Um, and house prices uh, in this model, uh, with this, uh, they don't really move either across these low and high periods. And this result is, uh, is consistent with what's found in the kaplan mittman violante paper um, when they just have income shocks. And uh, typically these uh, house prices, they're gonna really move with this aggregate loan stock. Um, and that's uh, fairly constant over this period. Um, so that's why there, there's not much movement in, in these house prices. Um, so as I mentioned, the loans, they're also fairly, fairly constant, um, except they dip a little bit in, in the middle of the boom. Um, any questions on, on these results? Uh, like I said, a uh, fairly, uh, um, uh, so kind of digging into a two period version of this model where I shut down um, sort of this borrower heterogeneity, and I'm just looking at a representative borrower and lender. Um, I'm gonna try to see where, maybe I can't figure out where some of this house price movement is coming from. Uh, so here I have the uh, policy functions for uh, the good state and this bad state, um, and the x-axis here is gonna essentially be, be the loan endowment. Um, and so starting in this uh, left panel here, uh, borrower consumption is going to be higher in the good state and lower in the bad state. That's consistent with, with the aggregate case, um, which I have plotted as the uh, color dot and then the uh, outline dot. Um, and consumption is um, actually much higher um, in this aggregate model, but it seems like the magnitude between the two states is, is fairly similar um, in the movement. Um, so looking at the uh, Two period model um, with the house price moving to the, the right uh, uh, graphic here. Um, again, you get a fairly similar movement in house prices, uh, the same as consumption between this low state and um, the, the high state. Um, and this is sort of in contrast to what I saw in this, uh, the aggregate model where house prices didn't move uh, across the states. Um, and again, this can sort of be traced back to overall borrowing is lower in, in the aggregate model with the longer horizon um, than in just this, this two period uh, representative agent model. Um, any questions here? I guess I'm still puzzled uh, if you can go back for one slide. I'm, sure. I'm still puzzled why house prices don't move, why the aggregate loan stock doesn't move very much. Can you, can you just explain that again? Um, so yeah, so I would say um, within the, uh, sorry, I, I could have the, the, the loans here in this, uh, like a, a smaller period of the model. Um, it, they're not really shifting across states and that's because um, lenders aren't exposed to this aggregate risk. Um, so they're not really willing to take it on. And so uh, this is sort of leaving these borrowers very exposed to these, these income shocks. They can't really insure against them, um, hmm. which, is, which is why um, the loans are sort of uh, more or less flat. Um, in this um, uh, model with, without default. Um, and then, um, like I said, house prices, uh, typically in this two period model, they, they are higher in this good state than the bad state, so we would expect that, but it's mostly this lower loan stock that I think is keeping them um, relative down. If, that, if there's more movement in the loan stock, I would expect to see more movement in, in prices. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, so now I'm going to uh, add in a uh, default into this model um, and to sort of illustrate what this does in the most uh, starkest terms. So I've essentially shut down the collateralization um, and what can happen here is that these loans can become uh, prohibitively expensive um, and this is going to be, uh, especially if this uh, probability of default is, is high. Um, so essentially, as I, as I said here, if that, um, there's a high chance of default, this is really going to push down this loan price, which is really going to push up the risk premium. Um, and in this uh, example with the two-period model, 
um, essentially these borrowers aren't gonna uh, borrow in this, this bad state even though they're able to. Um, so then they're essentially just consuming um, whatever their, their income down and, and, and other wealth is, is here. Um, and uh, typically in this good state out of this two period model, the paths of the, of the loan and, and the consumption um, are what would look like out of, out of a standard model. Um, if I sort of relax this assumption and allow uh, this uh, um, alpha to increase, and I'll show this with the aggregate model, um, this sort of uh, drop in the um, uh, uh, loan price is gonna be less magnified. Any questions here? Um, so uh, moving on to what the aggregate model, and here I'm sort of doing the opposite. So I'm setting this uh, uh, default here as a very high collateralization. So essentially these borrowers are gonna surrender their entire house. Um, and this is what the uh, uh, pricing equation looks like for the, for the loan price. Um, and again, essentially if uh, the uh, sort of uh, value of the house um, becomes less than uh, the mortgage they owe, um, this is gonna put a penalty, the lenders are gonna have to take that loss, so they're gonna charge this higher risk premium. Um, so in the uh, good state here, uh, so, so starting from the bottom, without default, um, the loan price is equal to uh, the risk-free rate. Um, and then even in the good state, so going back to the first line, the average across all borrowers, it's gonna be uh, slightly below um, and that's sort of to compensate for this risk in the bad state uh, when it, it, it drops um, more relative to, to the risk-free rate. Um, so this essentially some takeaways from this is that this uh, loan price, it's gonna be increasing in this alpha. Um, and, that, uh, and, and, and one way to sort of um, right now make this model tractable and behave is I'm essentially imposing that these households who default with positive equi equity, so these would be uh, strategic defaulters, they're gonna borrow um, at this, at this risk-free rate in this setup. So that's also part of the reason why um, these averages across the states are very close to the, the risk-free rate. And relative to the previous example in the two-period model, um, they, would, they would be a lot lower. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, um, once that goes away, if they default with positive equity, risk-free rate. Um, so going back to the um, original exercise I did with the uh, no default case, um, I'm going to increase income over the housing boom period. And um, what happens with consumption, it's actually gonna jump up more in uh, the, uh, across the boom period and then it's gonna fall by more in the bust. Um, and part of this is a little bit of the artifact of how I have this set up and how I have it scaled. So consumption is essentially starting from a lower um, point where it's normalized at, at the start of the boom here. So this is um, part of what's driving these, these dynamics. But if I look at sort of the volatility across the two series, it is going to be much higher um, in the case with, with default. Um, and uh, house prices here, they're still mostly flat. So there's a little bit more movement here um, in, this, in this case. But again, it's not really enough to um, pick it up on, on, on this chart. Um, and uh, to show you loans, so um, if I had plotted loans in the same exercise, they would have shot up a lot and it would have looked like, great, I'm producing the housing boom. Um, but essentially uh, the loan magnitude in the case with default is, is much lower, but it does actually rise over this, this housing boom period. Um, and uh, I think what's happening here is even though I'm getting this increase in loans, essentially this lower magnitude really isn't enough to um, really generate this, this increase in, in, in house prices that um, we, we were hoping to see um, in this time period. And essentially, if um, I sort of uh, relax this, this uh, exercise and I make this alpha lower, so I make the default burden less, um, it's going to uh, make, as I mentioned, these, these uh, prices a lot more expensive and these uh, loans a little bit more volatile. Um, so as I said, this is kind of um, all I have for today with these uh, rational um, lenders. And um, as I mentioned, kind of going back to one of my initial examples, um, this would typically look like a, a city or region in the US that wasn't in the throes of the housing boom. That's very rational where um, even though there's this positive income shock, there really isn't um, 
much increase in, in, in lending or, or house prices over this period. Um, so uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Sorry, I'm ending a little bit early or. Um, I may have one or two, but I, I, I'm happy to let the others go first. Yeah, I was, so I was wondering, um, uh, you know, so I'm thinking here, so default is uh, really critical that you can see, you know, at least the results you showed us so far, right, with the consumption, more volatility of consumption. Right. Uh, uh, you know, and I, I think it would be nice, you know, I'm just thinking in Sweden, for instance, where we're from, there is, you know, it's, it's, uh, you cannot default on your housing uh, debt. Okay. And I actually think that uh, well, we've had a big housing. Well, I don't, but I don't know how to think about this. There is no housing. There is no house price boom in, in what you show us in your model. No? Right, right, yeah. Um, so this goes back to my original motivation that sort of under these rational expectations with this income shock, um, it's very difficult to to generate the, these dynamics from from income alone. Um, but kind of going back to your point of. Uh, in a model without uh, without default, where they sort of uh, have to um, essentially hold on to the, the the house despite being underwater or a negative income shock, um, that would probably uh, make sort of the effects of the bust a lot longer. Correct in this dimension, yes. Um, it would probably make gotcha. them a little, it, it, it it might be interesting to sort of see if that would make them the sort of agents a little bit more cautious because they know for a sufficiently large shock that they're going to be stuck this depressed consumption. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. gotcha. That's actually a nice segue into my question. So if maybe uh, I'm revealing my ignorance now, but uh, if alpha was a policy parameter and you had a planner solve this, would you find an interior solution or would you find uh, uh, what would be the optimal alpha? And, and the second sort of related question is, can I think of alpha as something like a mortgage modification type of parameter, or how do I think of it in, in sort of real world terms? Okay, um, so in, in, in real world terms, because typically um, you're going to uh, surrender your entire house if you uh, get foreclosed on in the US. Um, and I guess uh, some ways to sort of think about this um, would be that sometimes there can be foreclosure delays. So it's mm -hmm. sort of like how costly, um, what is sort of your housing loss or your housing cost um, in this, um, when it, when you default, so how quick is it to sort of get back to you know the housing you were at prior to this, or how costly is it? Um, and sort of this this length of time um, can actually depend on um, in, in the U.S. of whether the the laws which are by state, and in some states the lenders are actually able to kind of uh, go after uh, and uh, and recourse in in these mortgage loans. So that could be something where there's sort of um, higher default in certain states. Um, and that that certainly plays a role in the bust, but in the boom, again, a lot of the research on looking at these these different laws um, don't really have that much quantitative importance with all these other um, elements going on and and sort of the, the other channels um, to that regard. But um, um, I, I hadn't thought about solving sort of the optimal policy problem with that and what that should be be set up, but that that could be a potentially interesting exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm coming back to my question on the real rate. So you don't think would it be doable or non-doable here? I mean, the, the, the model you have features, I guess, that's like a constant share of spent on housing in the steady state, I guess. Right. Yes. Um, so, so you're saying not, with the... Now you... Oh, sorry. No, no. I'm, I'm, so I'm just curious how it would work in your model if, you know, there were expectations on lower, on, you know, lower service cost of user cost, essentially, through a lower equilibrium real rate. But maybe that's a very hard thing to do. Um, I guess the, the most tractable way to do it is uh, I've sort of abstracted away from this, but in the lenders problem, um, I could introduce sort of a, uh, where they have a, uh, they borrow from foreign entities and sort of have a deposit liability. Um, and then mm -hmm. sort of what the rate is on those deposits can influence uh, sort of the risk-free rate or, or the, sorry, not, or the rate they offer on loans. Um, and so that exercise could be potentially sort of, um, you know, shocking or reducing or putting some expectation process on, on their um, risk-free rate on deposits and how that, that would feed through the model um, to, to that regard. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I think wow. also too with the um, sort of um, non separable preferences, you would sort of get the uh, sort of if they do experience this lower real rate that would um, increase consumption and also increase their their demand for, for housing as well rather than have it um, and get more at the expenditure share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Hello, Margaret. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I wanted uh, to come back to your motivation at the beginning. Okay. The regional heterogeneity. How are you right. thinking of that with regional heterogeneity income? household income or supply regional banks with different beliefs? What's your idea? Um, so the idea with the, I'm, I'm still working through that. So with the um, income of its, I, I don't have this, this chart with me today, but it's very interesting because if I look at income across the states in sort of the 1990s or the, the bus period, um, they essentially follow a very similar distribution. But in the 2000s, it seems like the distribution is a lot wider. So some states are getting hit with like a higher income shock some states are getting hit, hit with a lower. Um, and I was hoping to sort of see if, you know, sort of these lower states had lower house prices and higher ones at higher house yep. prices, but um, it, it really wasn't uh, that simple um, to that regard. Um, and uh, so, it, uh, so that was sort of just to try to, to get at, um, I guess if, if, if you're a lender, as I mentioned in my example, and sort of one of these uh, places like, like Cleveland where you, the dynamics sort of mimic what I just showed, you know, are these lenders sort of following a more rational expectation versus if you're in um, Phoenix where they have very high population growth, um, are they um, maybe following more of, an, of a um, departure from that? Um, and, and a belief to that regard. So I would sort of be um, calibrating different versions of this model rather than actually trying to do some sort of um, regional risk sharing or um, incorporating heterogeneous regions in, in this model to that regard. Okay, good. Um, okay, anyone else with a question for Margaret? If not, uh, I would like to thank Margaret for her presentation. That was very interesting.